We can start. Great. Perfect. All right. Everybody, settle down. Let's uh, get started here. Oh, wait, not that close. Welcome to the Future of Small Languages panel. I'm Chris Weber. I'm going to be the moderator of this fine event. Uh, and now the uh, other panelists may introduce themselves. So good morning. I'm Ludovic Cortez. Uh, I'm co-maintainer of GNU Guile together with Andy Wingo and Mark Weaver, uh, also working on GNU Geeks. Hi, I'm Justin Cormack. Um, I work on various open source projects for Docker. Um, my interest in small languages comes from using being a long-time Lua user. Um, hello, I just graduated as a software engineer. I studied at the university where Lua was created. I forgot to say my name. I'm Etienne. And, um, and yes, I am very passionate about Lua. Well, great. Uh, well, it's been a year since we did this same panel. Uh, uh, it seems like, you know, lots of things have been moving fast in the language world. Uh, so what, well, maybe we should open up with between this and last year, what's been the, the ch maybe the, the change in the vision of the future of small languages? What's the interesting things that are happening respectively in Guile and Lua from your, your perspectives? So I feel like there, there's there been a lot of new people probably coming to Guile, and part of it is due to the fact that there is a new dynamic, I mean, with Guile 2.2 coming up, and people are trying new things. So there are like people like Chris, for instance, looking at networking and asynchronous programming, trying to take advantage of the limited continuations and this kind of feature that is not unique to Guile, but still quite you know, you don't find it in, in every language, I guess. Um, yeah, so there's been a renewal of interest, I would say, in Guile. And also, because Guile 2.2 is going to be faster, there's also people looking at things that we just wouldn't even consider before, like doing, uh, you know, game engines and doing that kind of stuff. And that's, you know, you need some, some sort of performance that we just didn't have before. And now it's really getting interesting. We can go deeper and to the lower levels. So I, I think that's that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, apart from that, I should also, I guess, mention Geeks, which is, uh, you know, a package manager and distribution. And I guess the number of people are coming to Geeks because of its features as a package manager, you know, but you get to learn Scheme somehow, even if it was not your intent. And, and yeah, I'm guessing people are starting to write more Scheme also because of Geeks. Um, I, I don't know, Lua, Lua tends to be quite a slow moving language. And what, what, what we find, we've got multiple implementations. I think one of the things I noticed is yeah, as people continue to make more implementations of Lua. Um, we've had g people asking me about the Go implementation, the OCaml implementation, and various other ones. I, um, and while Lua has this great high-performance Lua jet, again, that's kind of divided the community because it's a separate implementation and is not entirely compatible. So in a way, I think we've got, we've got, um, we've got a problem of, of too many Luas, not, not too few. And that's one of the things I've really been kind of worrying about this year that that we haven't got a single I mean there we haven't got a single lower community so much as as I would have hoped. I think that's uh, a matter of perspective because well some people in the community tend to see it as different things or look at it oh it's all lower it's all in the same family and um and the more things I see happening to me, it seems like, okay, there's more people involved and we could just like get together and consider it the same thing and things would um, move along easier. But um, apart from more Lua implementations coming up, what I have seen um, changing from last year to now, um, two things. Um, one, I think that more and more Lua is... Um, um, being in in advance in the uh, in the machine learning field, so there is a framework called Torch that uses Luajet because of its um, uh, very fast performance, and um, it's interesting because there are lots of important companies backing it up. If you go to the list of contributors, you see people from Facebook, Twitter, Google, so. It's nice to see that there are big companies giving uh, um, support in the end. Um, 
it's important and helps a lot. Um, apart, um, and besides that, I think that we're also seeing like a, a momentum in terms of community this year. We are having three Lua related conferences this year, which I think it's a new record ever since I've been following uh, um, what goes on with Lua. So we have like one in Russia, one in Brazil, and we'll have the Lua workshop somewhere. And um, there's the Lua Dev Room. Um, so if they count that um, as a community, as an important community, then that's four. So there seems to be like lots of things going on and lots of people starting to see Lua recently. So this community momentum, I think it's happening right now and that's that's very different than it was from last year. Well, uh, we don't have multiple guiles. Well, we sort of do with the multiple versions, but we have uh, so many schemes that I guess that we've got yeah. a similar problem there. But uh, um, well, that actually brings up an interesting conversation uh, about uh, when experimentation with different implementations and divergence and when divergence, whether it's a kind of a linear progression of new features um, or, uh, you know, actually, you know, having different implementations or um, and et cetera, uh, in which ways can this be beneficial? In which ways can it kind of hamper things? Is it is it net positive or what do you what do you all think? Um. So yeah, with respect to Gile, it's it's traditionally been pretty much a slow-moving project, I think. And so the the approach that we had was to have, you know, stable series which are s like super stable, like they're yeah, basically very few new features, if any. And so we would you know create a new stable series every time we wanted to do something important, and that's. That's a good thing in a way because people using the stable series know that it's stable. But on the other hand, it gives us as as Gile developers an incentive to actually go ahead and push as many new features as we can in the new stable release, right? And so we we have a tradition of having, you know, new stable releases. So currently, 2.2 is is in the works. So we call it 2.1 because it's not fully stable yet. Uh, but there many many new features like it's a it's essentially a new compiler it's a new virtual machine for instance so you can imagine um well as a user of guide that's not necessarily something that you that you would notice right except that it's faster uh, but yeah still i mean uh, and that that's just the surface of things there are so many new features every time um largely thanks to Andy Wingo, who, is, who has been doing crazy work on this particular release. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, in the past, that was also a huge difference between Guide 1.8 and 2.0. And we know that for some projects, some users, it's been uh, quite a bit of a step to move from one stable release to, to the next one. Um, some projects just were relying, like, on internals on, of the previous stable release, and that has led to problems too. So it's I don't know what the ideal model is. I think there are good things about the way Guile has been doing things, but it's also for users it's also usually a bit of a step to switch from one version to the next one. So I don't know how you handle things. Well I think that the um I mean the, the two main implementations are the the standard Lua which is great and fast and then we have Lurgit which is extraordinarily fast like orders of magnitude faster and is uh, native C speed and that created a whole different set of applications that people are interested in and I mean, there's things like um, Snap Switch which and Andy Wingo actually works on for example which um, you know is 10 and 100 gig Ethernet switching in user space all written in Lurgit which is an you know really an application that no one would have even considered doing had there not been a different fast implementation that was designed around performance and had a really easy to use C FFI interface. Um, and then there's other people using that, Cloudflare, uh, using it. There's a, um, they've done a eBPF compiler so you can run the code in, in the Linux kernel, among other things. And so there's a, there's a whole 
different set of community and different people that came from a different implementation because its performance was so was so different and suddenly there's a bunch of you know kind of systems programmers and people using it um which is very different you know from the kind of games and embedded scripting in um in other like you know other um other use cases so i think that a radically different implementation can you know bring in a whole different community and who's interested in different things and add a whole lot of diversity and and new ideas and new new use cases so i think it um it can it can be really constructive to have something that's not entirely 100% compatible if it gives you new opportunities to to try out new things and work in with bring scripting to new areas that haven't been scripted before um um uh, i don't think i have much to add in that but just to explain the current issue between um having a um, logit and the uh, vanilla well, besides that um the logit has this uh, incredible performance so this is a good thing but the problem is, is that um uh, the syntax compatibility is basically locked in the old Lua version, which is the Lua 5.1. So a lot of people will have, will be, you know, blocked in upgrading their... And the FFI interface in Lua uh, that everyone uses. Yeah. Not, which is a big chunk that's not compatible. E exactly. And, but even if we're trying to work with something that is, like, cross-compatible with different Lua implementations, you will, for example, write it in the Lua 5.1 manner so we can run on vanilla Lua and, and Lua JIT. And I like many of the features of Lua 5.3 that are not present in Lua JIT, for example. So this is the problem we have that we are still looking, hoping for a solution. Um, but yes, I am very happy that we have all this new bunch of people using Lua for different problems. So Aitan, you brought up something that I wanted to follow up on, which was about the growth of Lua's community. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, in kind of our pre-conversation about this, we all agreed that we were interested in the conversation around community. So I'm interested in what do you think you can, we can all do to improve our communities in, uh, and what do you think, or just generally comments on community, where you'd like it to see it to go, what are our current strengths, what could we, what could we do better at this point? So, yeah, like, like I was saying, with the advent of Guile 2.2 and before that 2.0, we've been seeing more um, technically diverse communities around Guile, because Guile used to be targeting a very specific community which was you know embedding languages like pretty much like Lua in a way maybe more heavy rate but still you know embedding in a big C application that was the main use case and starting from 2.0 it's become a you know a standalone scheme implementation so that has attracted people who just want to write entire programs directly in scheme and and yeah with 2.2 we're gaining more again traction in different domains like I said before because it's just it has better performance and it's I guess it's similar to what happens with Luajit. So that's for the technical part of it. Um, well then there are also there is the issues in general but which are not related to technicalities just like in many free software communities I guess. Um, I mean we've been trying to work on it but that's yeah that's that takes time I, I guess. I think in in many ways with with a, with a scripting language you have to work much harder on community it's quite there's there's a lot less commonality between people who are writing enhancements to world of warcraft in lua and people who are writing 10 gig ethernet switch software in lua it's a you know the d domains are very different and um a lot of the stuff they the way they use things the the libraries they use and things i mean um especially i think because Lua doesn't try try and force a standard library on you or anything, so um, it's 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 been it's been quite a difficult process of community building across that sort of thing. I think it's um, it has actually started working, but you have to have a bunch of people with really diverse interests who are who are interested in you know bringing these people together and trying to get them to talk to each other. 
um, and some of whom are uh, historically people who don't talk much. I mean, the games industry was always one of the early adopters of Lua, but they're not very um, they're not very op open source oriented. They're not as, or historically. I think um, the kind of accessibility of mobile gaming and things has actually changed that a little bit. But the the big companies are certainly not very not very open, and so his, I think that's why they're historically there wasn't much of a community. It was a very quite narrow. It was the people who were actually interested in implementing the language who formed the community. But I think um, we've been working on that, and I think and having people who are you know just interested in way software is used in very diverse environments really helps. Um, um, yes, I mean, not only the, um, the game community is, uh, um, as I said, historically not doing lots of open source and not discussing lots about what they do. Um, many small companies using Lua Embedded as well, they're not, they're a type of, uh, of groups Will always be writing everything from scratch, and then not not something specific to their use cases, and not putting things, not putting the modules on on Lua rocks, not using things that are on 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 Lua rocks, and then it's it's a process. Uh, um, like uh, I remember um, Hishen, who who is the lead developer of our packet manager of Lua rocks, like he he will go personally to. GitHub repositories and say, you know, this could be in Lua Rocks, and just like create an issue, and people will be like, hey, you know what, that's that's true, like why not? And then somebody will create the the Rocks pack, and then and then will be finally be be shared and as as a library. So you know, it's a little bit like poking around and talking to people, like, oh hello, you 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 could do this, you could do that, and uh, and slowly things uh, start moving around. So it's also a matter of convincing people to do community things as well. It's, as I said, it's very difficult to get people together and get them, them to talk to each other. But at some point, you just have to say, you know what? You're going to meet at this place. Everyone show up. And some people will show up. So uh, you always say, oh, no, I'm going to make this event, and, and, and I, I don't know if you're going to have uh, an important number of people. And in the end, this, this is not important. You just create something. People will show up, and it grows from there. And you have to convince others that this actually works. So um, I organized last year a conference on Lua in Rio, and I had no idea if people would show up. And in the end, um, the auditorium was full. It was like, see, things things happen. So I, I'm trying to convince some friends to organize meetups in their cities. <laughs> and that also takes a little bit of s some folks being proactive and, and bothering um, and making things happen. I just wanted to, to add a note about package managers like Lua Rocks. I remember we discussed it last year, and honestly, as a guy person, I'm a bit jealous of things like Lua Rocks or you know all the package managers for languages. And at the same time, as a distro person, I don't really like them because they are separate. They create new problems, but still, I mean, when it comes to you know growing a community, I think it's it's obvious nowadays that it's really helpful to have this kind of infrastructure. Um, and we don't really have it in Guile because, yeah, we don't. We have Geeks as a package manager, but it's not maybe not suitable for everyone. And we also don't have a standard way to like to package your software. Like you know, most people would use Auto Tools and and you know this kind of stuff to 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 configure and package your software. But yeah, that's that's not really something we. We want to encourage because I mean it 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 raises the barrier to entry, and so we, I think we have a problem that we should fix here in Guide because that's probably one of the things that that prevents us from really growing the community. Okay, a couple more questions, and then we're going to open it up to audience questions. I think, um, but you mentioned infrastructure, and I think you were talking about language infrastructure. But I'm really interested in the in the topic of infrastructure generally, right? So, um, you know, what's 
what kind of infrastructure support do you have? Would you like to have, you know, whether or not it's, you know, being under an umbrella organization, Giles under GNU, right? Or whether or not it's, you know, having companies actually use it to implement things and have people be paid. Uh, what what infrastructure do we have and what infrastructure do we want? Maybe we should stop. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> Could you start? Yeah. I, am, I, am. I think. Um, I, I mean, I think Lua is quite diverse, and therefore, I think one umbrella might be difficult. We have um, we have a mixture of. I mean, Lua came out of a, a originally a a university, but um, around a commercially funded project, and that kind of is a, is. The mix that Lou has always kept. There's a, there's been corporate sponsorship in various kinds of ways of hiring people to work on things that involve Lua, um, and Lua JIT was is has kind of was again it was a sort of it was a independent project but always funded um, by a mixture of people in the gaming industry, Cloudflare, um, other people like that, and so. We've kind of managed without any kind of overarching organization. Um, I think that, um, and then the, the, I think it's kind of worked okay. It's, um, um, I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure that a central organization or umbrella is necessarily useful. Um, I think that the main thing is whether the community is healthy, whether people are, are working on it and and so on but it's um i think the things like the package management and things it's good to have a single point of focus it's taken a very long time actually for lower rocks to to become that it's um and other projects are still using their own package management and things like that, um for lower packages still and so i think those kinds of things it's it's good to have that some focus around some of those kind of unifying things but overall, um, the little kind of homes that Lua has, I mean, the, the, um, um, around pr the projects have, have generally worked quite well. Um, yes, I think you're right in the sense that Lua has been doing all right with all this kind of uh, um, umbrella organization around it. But at the same time, I think I would like if, if Lua had one, because I think it will make things easier for individuals trying to do stuff, especially for someone um, like me that tries to do stuff within the community, and I want to do something, it's like, who do I talk to about this? Do I just send an email to Roberto directly? This doesn't seem all right. It's like, I don't know, having a group of people who are responsible for, I don't know, contacting companies, getting funds, uh, uh, starting projects, making things happen. And, and unfortunately, in the end, it comes down um, to money and money has to appear from somewhere. And um, it would be easier if there were people responsible for organizing all that. So... Um, Uh, I was involved um, twice, not as an organizer, so it was, uh, I once participated as a student, and last year I participated as a mentor. Yes, yes, so there are, there are some things, where I, but they are not, there's, so there's the, the research uh, laboratory of Lua inside uh, the university. So they are the same people who are responsible for working on the language implementation. So so they are the PhD students who are doing their, their thesis and, and, and they are the ones who are organizing the Google Summer of Code because they want to. So they are allocating their time uh, um, you know they are doing something for the community in that sense, and um, and they're very mo small group of people. There are like two or three people who are like university prof uh, professors, and uh, so there isn't any. Uh, there isn't one person who is, you know, allocated 
to be responsible of of managing uh, um, the sport, and I think that this will be very useful. Yeah, I think the Google Summer of Code is one of those things where there has to be an official organisation for them to consider you. So it does, it, yeah, it does help that we've we've got this kind of the PUC, which we can kind of use as that for some purposes. But it's not, um, yeah, there, it, that is one of the cases where yeah, Google doesn't let a community have have students for Summer of Code, which is kind of um, perhaps a bit remiss on their part, but uh, you can see why why they might want to do that. Um, um, but there are lower projects sometimes in other from other organisations as well. I mean, we, um, and I think generally um, you can some of, you can make Summer of Code work for other other means. I mean, I've I've had. Um, some, uh, quite often, there's there's other organisations that are interested in things. Yeah, so I, th I think Gail is quite different from Lua in this respect because so 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 Gail is part of the GNU project and the GNU project itself gets its infrastructure sponsored by the the Free Software Foundation. So for instance, the you know the servers that hold the websites that hold the Git repositories and all that. This is all it all comes for free for us, so to speak, and it's. You know, we know it's being handled by by people who will remain true to their mission, and so that that's really a great thing to have. Um, apart from that, I think Gail is really a, some sort of a grassroots kind of uh, project. In that, I mean, unlike Lua, it's not an academic project initially. It's it's not an industrial project either. So it's really a bunch of hackers initially who said, well. What if we kind of extended what Emacs does to all of the operating system, roughly? And they started working on this project. And so that has a different feel, maybe, as to how the project works. And maybe that also explains why, historically, it has had very little corporate funding behind it. Although, well, we see now a few companies actually developing Guile code, but that's still a little bit marginal, I guess. Um, yeah, so that's 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 what we have in terms of infrastructure, but also being part of GNU means that we can participate in the Google Summer of Code pretty easily because GNU is the umbrella organization. So that's another another way where it helps to have an umbrella organization like this. Okay. One last question before we get to the audience, uh, and that's so it seems like to me that we're in an exciting era when it comes to languages, right? Like. Uh, Back in 2003 or so, it felt like it was the world of languages was like, don't bother with new languages. We've got Java and we've got .NET and just use those. Don't like, you know, and like though there was interesting work being done on virtual machines, I feel like not like there. But like now there's so many interesting things going on, you know, from type stuff to, uh, you know, just about everything. So what what are you most excited of about language design outside of your project? Um, outside of Guile or Lua, what are you, um, or, you know, it can be about each other, but it could also be about something, a completely different language. What What's most exciting to you right now that maybe you want to bring into your language or maybe you just think is interesting externally? Do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think it is, it, it's, it's, it's a good, interesting time that um, new languages are taking off relatively quickly um, compared to, uh, I mean, it, you know, compared to the fact that, you know, consider, I mean, Lua is over 25 years old. It's similar age to, to Perl and um, Perl and Python, those languages. And those those languages have, have served us well, and they, they've been incredibly helpful over the years. But it's nice to see a whole bunch of different thing, languages. I think, I mean, I, I've i always, I was exposed to functional programming quite early on, and I've always been really keen on strong typing for many use cases. And I'm, I, I you know, I think Rust is really exciting as a language, and I'm, I'm, um, I've even started trying to write some code in it. Um, and I, I've got some projects that I want to use it for um, going forward. So I think that um, the use of typing in Rust to do different things like uh, linear memory allocation is really exciting. I don't think that it um, will ever affect the, the 
scripting languages like Lua should have strong typing, probably. I think it's still a, a very different thing, but I'm kind of flexible on that. It'd be interesting. I mean, there have been some experiments with sort of gradual typing in scripting languages, but I'm not sure that how useful they really are. Um, I mean, I sort of sense that the, in a way that the thing that's, um, the competition for something like Lua is not big, complicated, or languages that take time to learn, like um, Rust, is really the competition is things like um, uh, more complicated configuration formats, really, that, and you, you see people having the sort of choice between static configuration or slightly more, you know, or scriptable, and that that's the kind of choice that they're, they they actually spend their time making rather than shall we use a strongly typed language for scripting or a, or a weakly typed language. It's less of a, it, it's, 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 that's not really quite where the choices are. Well, I could use Lua and better than Rust. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, this is a difficult question for me because all the languages I've been using other than Lua are languages that are like less than Lua. But um, I'm really excited to learn a bit about Elixir. Um, I, I haven't done much um, functional programming yet. I've done, um, I've done a lot of Haskell in the university, but it was you know one of those modules that as soon as you get your grade, you go like... Yeah. And, um, so, so I really want to to get back to it, and I um, to me it seems like Alexa is a very um, nice opportunity. The the community seems active, which is something important to me. So, normally um, Haskell doesn't do community much, and um, well, uh, since Ruby, some sort of adopted um, some of the Alexa activities because of some important key people who are common to the, um, this and uh, this both technologies um, there are things going on and this excites me and and um, some of the language features itself as well so I'm, I'm hoping I will get my hands on some Alexia version yeah so so for me I so there I see a lot of excitement around rust and I I don't feel like I'm really excited about the language itself, I don't know, but I, I'm not super familiar with it either. But I, I am really excited about what people are doing with it. And it seems that it's, you know, it's targeting a very wide range of applications. Um, like yesterday, there was a talk about a microkernel written in Rust. And I think it's great. I think we need, you know, memory safe languages, and we need to, at some point, start getting rid of C because we know all the troubles that it gives us, right? Uh, so that's really the part I'm excited about when it comes to Rust. Then I'm very much into functional programming. So, yeah, I see really a lot of momentum around functional programming. So we see lots of new functional languages like Elm, like Clojure, where well, Clojure is not so new now, but I mean, there's a lot of work going on. And of course, the big ones, Haskell or Camel, um, I mean, there are so many things going on there that, you know, there occasionally we we start chatting on Hashgar, for instance, and we get jealous about this or that feature of that language. So I'm a bit disappointed in a way that there are so many different languages. I think people maybe could kind of focus on one instead of creating a new one like Elm, for instance. I mean, there are people working on Haskell, uh, on, yeah, Haskell, Compilers that generate JavaScript. I think that's 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 a more uh, fruitful approach. Uh, but yeah, yeah, there are so many things to be excited about in terms of languages and functional languages in particular these days. So for Gail, I would like to also explore a bit a way of going a bit closer to some sort of static typing. Uh, I mean, Scheme has macros, and people in Racket have showed that, you know, you can use and abuse macros to come up with some sort of a typed uh, language. And that's really something I would like to explore. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, there, there are cases where using purely dynamic typing is kind of, you know, not so great, right? 
Um, so that that's one of the things I would like to explore for for Guy. Yeah. Cool. So uh, let's open it up. Who has questions from the audience? Who? Right. Uh, okay. So um, the 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 question was for Guile about the 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 relatively few amount of language bindings that we have. Uh, pass that over to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I mean, yeah, this is true. We have probably much fewer bindings than Perl, for example. Uh, I think the situation has been improving though since 2.0 because with the FFI, the foreign function interface it's become much easier and less cumbersome to write bindings. And, you know, you just write a bunch of scheme lines and it's pure scheme. You don't even have to bother about having a complex build system or anything. And so that's allowed people to actually come up with quick bindings that actually work pretty well. And so we've made progress. And, yeah, that... Someone should give a talk on how to do that. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, I think... Um, I mean, Lua, one of the reasons for the adoption of LuaJet uh, was that it came with an FFI, and it is it does make an enormous usability difference, um, and it's it's kind of um, it's part of the what I talk, spoke to earlier about the division between the two communities because everyone who uses LuaJet writes FFI bindings which are not available for the standard Lua, and writing bindings for both is. Uh, twice as much work because they're so different, um, and we've talked about some ways to fix that. But it's 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 difficult because Lua's very strict on we only use standard C, and you can't write an FFI binding in standard C. Um, um, so we've got this 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 division. But I mean, yeah, the the ease of the ease of writing a very quick FFI binding is like enormously better, and it. It definitely makes a lot of difference from that point of view if you want to increase the number of bindings. I mean, you didn't. Often the FFI bindings are so easy to write, you don't go and look for someone else's bindings anymore. You just write the C headers, import the C headers, and write three lines of of binding, and that's just kind of a it's, it's a magically better way to iterate fast on on stuff. Okay, we have time for one more question. You shut up fast, so. Do you think that be, um, would it be useful to have a common interface from one programming language to another? Uh, something I came up with when I was doing some genetic programming work, <coughs> where I did a system with a plugin, gave it a language name, and a fragment of code, and it was quite a plugin for that language. Right, okay, so the question is about generic interfaces for languages uh, so that you can use multiple languages. Uh, um, anybody have a strong? Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah, I think I think it is useful. I mean, in, there's, there's two things, I think. One is that the, the lowest common denominator is the, the C API, but there are problems about types um, and structured types. I think that, um, I mean, at work, we spend a lot of time using things like um, protobufs, which is available for quite a lot of languages and is quite good. It's quite heavyweight, though. Um, and I think that um, there are, um, you know, there are kind of attempts to do something a bit more lightweight. But it, I think that at least there's been a set of projects around what does interlanguage communication look like? How do we transfer structured data that's, of a, you know, a, that's in a way that's better than just passing everything through JSON or something like that. And um, I think that um, I think that, that those approaches are really valuable because I think that uh, um, the C interface is really low level for a lot of stuff. And it's good for library bindings. And it's, uh, and it's probably going to be the interface even when we stop using C and we're all using other languages. I think the C, uh, the C interface is really convenient for low level stuff, but for 
higher level scripting it's it's not very not very convenient um yeah, actually, Guile started its life in the 90s at, at a project that would unify all all the dynamic languages, I would say. <laughs> so, so the story was that we'd have a common runtime system, uh, and all the languages would use that runtime, that VM, essentially. And so at the time, people were saying, yeah, we'll have... So to begin with, we'll have Scheme and Emacs Lisp, and then we'll have Python and Perl and whatnot. Uh, and I started as a strong supporter of this approach. I was like, yeah, this is the way. Uh, but then people actually started to try to, to do it, and especially in the context of Emacs Lisp. And you would think that Emacs Lisp and Scheme are pretty much the same thing, right? Oh, uh, yes, except there's one tiny difference, for instance, which is that uh, Emacs Lisp has a special value, which is nil, which means both false and the empty list. Whereas Scheme doesn't have that, it has instead the empty list and false, which are disjoint. And that tiny detail already causes a lot of headache. Right. Um, and then if you look at Guide 2, there's um, a ECMA script, JavaScript frontend also. Uh, you would think JavaScript is a dynamically typed language, it's not that different from Scheme, but s still, I mean, it's, it's too different already, so you cannot really interact seamlessly between Scheme and, and JavaScript, that wouldn't work so well. So I've become more skeptical of the unified language approach. Do you want to add anything or should we go to closing remarks? Yeah, um, yeah I don't think I have much to add to this one. I mean, um, Lua has been used a lot as some sort of glue language because it has um, so many uh, um, bindings to many other languages, but it was mostly on a project-based uh, approach where all you need, uh, I need this program to talk to that program, and then they're both written in whatever language, and I will put Lua in between, and then magically um, glue them together. Um, Switch speakers. Okay. Um, well, thank so, you. So we've got an exciting room ahead for Guile here. I encourage people to close in a little bit so that people can fit. But uh, um, yeah.